Subcommittee on Energy and Mineral Resources will come to order. Subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on three bills uh, that would protect America's coastal communities from offshore oil and gas drilling and protect marine mammals from seismic air gun blasting. Under committee rule 4F, any opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and to the ranking uh, minority member or their designees. I'm going to ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they're submitted to the subcommittee clerk by 5 p.m. today. Hearing no objection, so ordered. I would first like to welcome the witnesses and thank them for traveling great distances to testify before the subcommittee this morning. Our oceans sustain a rich diversity of marine life and provide immense value to America's coastal communities by helping to generate billions of dollars in economic output and by supporting millions of jobs. Shoreline counties are home to over 125 million citizens, nearly 40% of the U.S. population, and the ocean economy employs more people than telecommunications, crop production, and, building construction, and the building construction industries combined. In my home state of California, close to half a million people are employed in the fishing, seafood, aquaculture, coastal tourism, and recreation industries, and these jobs generate over $12 billion in annual wages. My state and many other coastal states that are represented by members of this committee understand that our existing economies are incompatible with more offshore oil and gas development. Thriving fish stocks and healthy marine mam mammals off the coast of Oregon, New Jersey, Maryland, and Florida support tackle shops, whale watching tours, and seafood markets. And oil-free beaches and bays in California, in Virginia, and in the Carolinas drive businesses for local restaurants, for vacation rentals, and for outfitters. But coastal residents are not the only ones who will benefit from protecting these areas. Some of our nation's most majestic national park units, belonging to all Americans, are along our coast, including Arcadia, Biscayne, Cape Hatteras, and Assateague. People from all walks of life, from diverse backgrounds and both political parties cherish these special places and rely on healthy oceans, clean beaches, and abundant fish and wildlife that come with them. The Trump administration couldn't care less about coastal communities and has decided to risk the livelihoods of millions to further pad the pockets of a handful of oil and gas industry executives. The Interior Department has proposed opening more than 90% of the Outer Continental Shell to oil and gas developments, including the entirety of America's Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf Coasts. Under this plan, the risks from offshore drilling would extend from the rocky shores of Maine down to the Florida Everglades and from California's sunny beaches to fishing in native communities in Washington State and Alaska. In total, President Trump wants to, stat wants to satisfy Big Oil's insatiable appetite with over 1.6 billion acres of America's oceans, all, all the while rolling back the safety and environmental protections which were developed in response to the 2010 Deepwater Horizon disaster. But I have news for the President. Americans have zero interest in, handle, in handing more of our oceans over to oil and gas co corporations. As Congressman Cunningham has so eloquently said time and time again, when you drill, you spill. The inevitable spills and the variety of other onshore and offshore impacts from oil and gas drilling have no place along our east and west coast or in the eastern gulf. 
Over one million people are employed by the tourism and recreation industries along the East Coast. Those are real jobs that exist now and will only grow if we continue to treat our oceans and coasts with care. That's over four times as many jobs as the industry-generated fantasies that come with opening the entire Atlantic seaboard to drilling rigs. Four times as many jobs would be at risk from the industrial facilities that will be built along the coast. Four times as many jobs would be at risk from the chronic pollution and pipeline spills that are widespread with offshore oil and gas. And four times as many jobs would be at risk from a catastrophic blowout like the one we saw in the Gulf of Mexico only nine years ago. Despite the administration's attempts to hand over our oceans to the oil and gas industry, last Friday, a federal judge in Alaska ruled that the Trump administration was violating the law in the process. The, tr the judge struck down President Trump's attempt to reverse President Obama's permanent protection for most of the U.S. Arctic. Yet again, this administration is discovering that facts and reasoning actually matter in our system of government, and that despite their best efforts, the rule of law still holds sway in this country. But, the rule had, but this ruling by the judge has done nothing to protect the thousands of homes, beaches, and wildlife refuges, surf spots, restaurants, biking trails, and fishing alcoves that dot thousands of miles of U.S. coastline. This is Congress's job. I'm grateful that Congressman Cunningham and Rooney have authored legislation to do just that, and I wholeheartedly support this bill. With that, I look forward to the testimony from our witnesses, and I now recognize our ranking member, Go uh, Representative Gosar, for his opening statement. Thank Welcome you, Mr. Cha Chairman, for yielding, and thanks the wit for the witnesses making some time for us here today. Today, the subcommittee will consider three bills meant to stymie offshore domestic energy production on the Outer Continental Shelf, or the OCS. H.R. 1149, the Atlantic Coastal Economics Protection Act, sponsored by Rep. Van Drew, would prevent the administration from issuing five specific seismic survey permits, even after undergoing environmental review under the National Environmental Policy Act and the Marine Mammals Protection Act. Seismic testing has not occurred in the Atlantic Ocean since the 1980s, and the survey technology has advanced significantly since that time. Without updated resource assessments provided through modern seismic surveys, we do not have clear and comprehensive data on the oil and gas resources in the region or the most optimal location for potential wind energy projects. While Canada and Mexico are conducting seismic surveys in the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, proponents of this bill would rather we stay in the dark about our nationally owned resources on the OCS. H.R. 205, the Protecting and Securing Florida's Coastline Act of 2019, spos sponsored by Representative Rooney, would permanently extend the moratorium on energy production in the eastern Gulf of Mexico planning area set to expire in 2022. The final bill, H.R. 1941, the Coastal and Marine Economics Protection Act, sponsored by Representative Hunt Cunningham, would prevent oil and gas lease sales in the Atlantic and Pacific planning areas. Supporters of these bills allege that oil and gas development cannot occur alongside commercial fishing, tourism, recreational or military testing and training operations. However, the Gulf states have proven that all these activities can coexist and in fact benefit from one another. The coast of Louisiana, where the lion's share of offshore drilling occurs, boasts one of the most diverse and productive ecosystems in the world, supporting marine and wildlife habitat and a healthy commercial fishing industry. Furthermore, 36% of current oil and gas leases have stipulations to accommodate nearby military testing and training operations, demonstrating the compatibility of the DOD operations and energy development on the OCS. The long history of oil and gas developments in the Gulf of Mexico proves that balance, the ba that balance is achievable so long as we follow the process established in the law for stakeholder engagement and environmental review. These bills would pi bypass this process altogether by permanently banning production without consideration of the many benefits of offshore energy development. Furthermore, offshore oil and gas production is a significant source of federal and state revenues. 
In fact, offshore oil and gas development alone contributed over $30 billion to the Federal Treasury and over $200 million to the Gulf states in fiscal year 2018. The Gulf production states of Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana receive a portion of the revenues generated from production on the OCS and rely on these revenues for programs related to conservation and coastal resiliency. Furthermore, oil and gas production on the OCS is the primary funding source for the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which my colleagues recently voted to permanently authorize. Each of these bills would take domestic energy resources off the table, increasing our dependence on foreign oil imports from some unfriendly actors whose environmental standards are significantly less stringent than ours. These legislative proposals would preclude the generation of billions of do dollars in revenues for the states, the federal treasury, and conservation programs, not to mention the creation of millions of jobs. Again, I thank the witnesses for being here today, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. Um, I ask unanimous consent for non-subcommittee members to participate in this morning's hearings. Hearing no objection, so ordered. We'll now receive testimony from um, the sponsors of today's bills. Our first witness will be uh, Congressman Cunningham. Congressman Cunningham is the representative for South Carolina's first congressional district and the sponsor of H.R. 1941, the Coastal and Marine Economies Protection Act. Welcome, Representative Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. This is an issue that's near and dear to my heart, and uh, it's uh, very personal for our district, which spans the uh, majority of the coastline of South Carolina, from Charleston all the way down to um, Hilton Head. Um, it's a uh, protecting those shorelines, a way of life, in the low country is a promise I made to the voters of the first district and it's a um, it's a promise that I intend to keep and it's why last Thursday that I introduced HR 1941 the Coastal and Marine Economies Protection Act which would permanently ban offshore drilling off the Atlantic and the Pacific Coast I'm proud to say that this bill is bipartisan uh, it has bipartisan support and I look forward to dis discussing the need for this bill uh, today in this hearing According to the South Carolina Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism, tourism is a $22.6 billion industry in South Carolina and supports one out of every 10 jobs in the Palmetto State. Um, you cannot have both offshore drilling and the booming tourism industry that we have in the low country. They are mutually exclusive pursuits. We have um, from Isle of Palms, the Sullivans, the, all the way down the Hilton Head, um, many treasures in the, in the first congressional district. And the tourism industry is another treasure that thrives off of having such beautiful beaches. And we know from the book of Matthew in chapter 6, uh, verse 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And it is in those treasures, in those beaches, and our natural resources of South Carolina, specifically the first congressional district, is where our heart is as well. Um, sure. We often hear from the oil and gas industry that large spills are not common. Um, I've said this before and I'll say it again. There is no such thing as a small oil spill. And when you drill, you spill. And nobody can truthfully look this committee in the eye and say that there will be no spills if we drill off the coast. Putting aside that inevitable risk, we're also confronted with another reality and that that is that offshore oil and gas comes with a large onshore footprint and we've talked about this in committee hearings um, Boehm's draft proposed program includes oil and gas sales in the South Atlantic which includes South Carolina in 2020 2022 and 2024 the port of Charleston is one of the largest East Coast ports and is critical to our state's economy and culture uh, any development that occurs in the South Atlantic will require extensive onshore development, which would threaten the Port of Charleston. There's no offshore oil and gas uh, support infrastructure on the East Coast, so this would need to be built. This onshore infrastructure brings its own serious risk. Uh, for example, uh, the Refugio uh, oil spill of May 2015 released over 140,000 gallons 
a crude oil from a ruptured pipeline, which fouled coastlines for miles and miles. And not that we need another level of uncertainty, but just to add one more to it, let us consider the hurricanes every year, which pummel our, our shorelines. Um, we have seen spills from onshore infrastructure in the path of a hurricane. Hurricane Katrina is the best known example, with roughly 8 million gallons estimated spilled. Um, individuals of both parties have made this clear to the administration that they do not, will not, and cannot support offshore drilling. And despite this, we're all facing the looming fear of its possibility on our shorelines. I want to state this very clearly for the record that every single city and town council along the South Carolina coastline has voted to oppose seismic testing and drilling. I want to say that one more time because this is important. Every single city and town council along the South Carolina coastline has voted to oppose seismic testing and drilling. This is a matter of economic prosperity and the future of Charleston, Beaufort, Hilton Head, as well as many other coastal communities. However, I feel that it's a moral issue as well. We're required to be good stewards of our environment and the caretakers of all creation. And I find it unconscionable that we, cannot, we can knowingly damage our waters and consequently our marine life for such a pursuit. Offshore drilling is reckless, harmful, and absolutely disruptive to the communities that we call home. And I urge all my colleagues to support our bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, now we would have had uh, Representative Van Drew, who is the representative from New Jersey's second congressional district and the sponsor of H.R. 1149, the Atlantic Coastal Economies Protection Act present. But unfortunately, uh, Congressman Van Drew is ill this morning and so we're going to dispense with his uh, testimony, five minute testimony, and so we're going to move right to Representative Rooney. Uh, Congressman Rooney is the representative for Florida's 19th Congressional District and the sponsor of H.R. 205, protecting, the Protecting and Security of Florida's Coastline Act. Mr. Rooney, you are recognized for five minutes and welcome to the committee. Uh, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Gosar, Congressman Cunningham, and members of the committee, thank you very much for allowing me to present and discuss H.R. 205 and the perils of offshore drilling in the eastern Gulf. This simple bill makes the moratorium on offshore drilling in the eastern Gulf of Mexico permanent. The moratorium was enacted in 2006 under President George W. Bush, advanced by Senator Mel Martinez, and unless this bill is passed, it's going to expire in 2022. Offshore drilling is an existential threat to our tourism and recreational economy. Tourism is highly competitive in any conditions or circumstances which could, however remotely or mistakenly, give rise to the possibility of a spill or other adverse impact to the west coast of Florida as a result of drilling and exploration in the eastern Gulf create these existential threats to us. Just this past year, the state of Florida passed a constitutional amendment banning offshore drilling. This amendment netted over 5 million votes statewide and passed with 68.9% of the vote. Fishing, tourism, and recreation account for $37.4 billion of GDP in Florida, including $17.5 billion just on the West Coast, and supports over 600,000 jobs. Following the Deepwater Horizon disaster, the West Coast of Florida faced lost economic value for, for commercial and recreational fishing and canceled trips from the Panhandle through Southwest Florida, despite minimal direct impacts to our coastline. You can only imagine what it would have been had there been direct impacts. As the Gulf Restoration Network study, which is attached here uh, for the record, uh, reflects, there are continual spills in the Gulf. The Taylor Energy leak, for example, uh, uh, has released approximately 1 million gallons of oil over the past 14 years. It was, as Congressman Cunningham referred to, the, the a leak caused by a hurricane. Uh, even Shell Oil, one of the best operators in the business, uh, has had a big spill uh, recently that dumped 1,900 barrels of oil in 2016 into the Gulf. And the next year, LLOG had a similar leak from a jumper pipeline that dumped as much as 9,350 barrels into the Gulf. And this is not to mention the bentonite and other chemicals which are released into the water when a well is being drilled. 
The Pew Research uh, Group has done a study about that where they monitor trace metals and chemicals in the waters around the rigs. And, and every well is connected to a pipeline. These pipelines leak. They're hard to inspect and hard to monitor. So spills happen at these things all the time as the Gulf Restoration Network has proven. All this is aside from the pernicious threats offshore infrastructure would engender to our area or any other area if drilling were allowed anywhere near our coast. Tank farms, moorings, docks, bollards, offshore supply vessels, barges are wholly incompatible with a tourist economy like ours and the abundant estuaries and mangrove barriers which are crucial as well to combat sea level rise. In addition to the serious economic risks, the United States does not need to trash the eastern gulf to be energy secure. Just yesterday, the Wall Street Journal ran an article that we have now tied Russia and Saudi Arabia in exporting oil of 10 million barrels a day. As the export-import charts I've attached here for the record show, we are now net energy exporters. The whole game has changed. The exploration of shale deposits via horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracking have revolutionized the energy industry. Further, there's just not enough oil in the eastern gulf to justify the threat to Florida. The major activity right now is offshore Mexico and South Texas. This independence in the United States is augmented by significant discoveries around the world, like offshore Israel, Sakhalin, and even a revival of North Sea. Again, our American free enterprise system has brought competitive innovation to the energy industry by allowing drilling these horizontal wells. In the Permian Basin of West Texas alone, studies say there are uh, 20 million barrels in the Wolf, Cat, Wolf Camp sand alone, excluding other barrels in the Sprayberry and the uh, Klein Shell. We have more reserves in the United States now than Saudi Arabia and Russia have in conventional reserves. And we're predicted to see a radical industry in the, in the movement of oil around the world as shown in the charts that I put in here. The industry admits this and is planning for it. In an interview in Fortune magazine in 2018, the CEO of Shell said that global demand for gasoline and diesel will peak as early as a decade from now and certainly by 2030. Any leasing activity undertaken in the Eastern Gulf after this moratorium expires will not be operational or in production when, before this massive decarbonization has set in. Shell's latest Gulf of Mexico project, the Vito rig, has been first designed as 40,000 ton platform, has been downsized to 8,900 tons, 20% of its original size. And according to the company, there's significant internal debate right now as to whether it's even worth building that one. Shell, like most other majors, is rapidly shifting to natural gas and shedding its most expensive oil assets like the Canadian tar sands. It's not germane for this hearing, but abundant natural gas is also a strategic asset for the United State, States vis-a-vis -vis our adversaries. In addition to the compelling economic case for making the drilling moratorium in the eastern Gulf permanent, taking the risk entirely off the table for Florida, which Florida is our third largest state of 21 million people, uh, certainly deserves is the Eastern Gulf is the home to the Gulf Test Range, a 120,000 acre a square mile range that stretches from the Florida Panhandle to the Keys. It is a crucial national security asset that cannot be carried out anywhere else in the United States. The vast size allows testing of hypersonic weapons, combat maneuvers training, drone testing, and untold future operations of weapons and platforms that need space for testing and restricted access for classified operations. Florida is home to the largest Air Force base in the country, Eglin, covering 640 square miles. The most critical training and testing uh, is based here. Next door is Holbert Field, where the Rapid Deployment Force uh, is based. Every night, Black Hawk helicopter sorties go out of Holbert to do nighttime testing in the range. At Boca Chica on Key West, we have the Naval Air Station Key West, where they train on the F-18s. Of course, everyone's familiar with MacDill and the important U.S. Central Command and the Special Operations Commands there. In May 2018, the Department of Defense published a study, which I put in here for the record. I, am I done? Yeah, just about done. Why don't you just draw it to a close? Okay. So basically, the, the study's in here, and I, I thank you for the uh, opportunity to testify and uh, to protect Florida from the menace of offshore drilling. Thank you, Representative Rooney. You're never done. You are completing your testimony. Thank you. Uh, with that, you've been uh, perfect time if you were a senator. I want to thank you, and I want to invite the next panel up to the up to the table.
Do we have the name plates of, of the members of the panel? I don't think anybody will mistake me for Mr. Rooney. <laughs> Thank you. To introduce our first witness, I will yield to Mr. Cunningham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Isle Palms is a, a beautiful barrier island off the coast of South Carolina. If you've never, never, ever traveled to that, uh, that part of the country, it is truly uh, magnificent, a uh, very special place uh, that, um, that you feel as soon as you're crossing over the bridge to enter that barrier island. Um, and we are proud uh, today to have with us uh, the mayor of that special place, uh, Mayor Jimmy Carroll, who represents Isle of Palms. Um, and it's, uh, it's one of the, f Isle of Palms is one of the four beaches that serves the city of Charleston in South Carolina. And uh, it's a beach that, uh, that, that I go to about every, every weekend. Um, and so it's got a special place that's near and dear to my heart, uh, it's personal to my family, and um, proud to have with us a long, a, a lifetime resident um, of that uh, beautiful place, uh, Mayor Jimmy Carroll, um, who is a constituent of ours, uh, who's a public servant, and um, most importantly, and most proudly, uh, someone I call a friend. And I'm um, honored to have Mayor Carroll provide testimony here, and I yield back. Thank you. Um, next, we have Mr. Vipe Desai. Mr. Desai is the owner of HDX Hydration Mix and a founding member of the Business Alliance for Protecting the Pacific Coast and also a neighbor to the 47th Congressional District. Welcome to the, to the, to the panel, Mr. Desai. Our third witness is Mr. David Yates. Mr. Yates is the executive director and the CEO of the Clearwater Marine Aquarium in Clearwater, Florida. And finally, we have Senator Sharon Hewitt. Ms. Hewitt is a state senator from Louisiana representing the first district. I want to welcome all the witnesses and remind them that they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the lights on the witness table will turn green, and after four minutes, the yellow light will come on. Your time will have expired when the red light comes on, and I may tap a little bit as that's happened, just to say, hey, try to close it down, your testimony, or finish your, <coughs> your testimony. But I, and I'm also going to allow the entire um, panel to testify before any of the members up here in the on the dais begin our questioning. The chair now recognizes Mayor Carroll to testify. Welcome to the committee, Mayor Carroll. Thank you Mayor very much Carroll. for allowing me to be here. Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Gosar, and fellow members of the Energy and Mineral Resources Subcommittee, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to address my concerns and opposition to offshore drilling in South Carolina, or for that matter, anywhere along our shores. My name is Jimmy Carroll. I am a lifelong member a resident of the Isle of Palms, and after two terms on city council, I was elected mayor. I am here to help you understand my passion for protecting our coast. The sea is my life, and tourism has been my livelihood for over 41 years. The Isle of Palms is seven miles long. It's a barrier island, which is about 10 miles outside Charleston. On the Isle of Palms, about one-third of the residents are owner-occupied. The other two-thirds are either a second home or vacation rentals. Our year-round population is just under 5,000 residents. However, in the summer, our numbers reach up to 35,000 visitors on a busy day. Our residents' lifestyle is subsidized by tourism. I grew up recreating on this beautiful island that I call home. My youngest of three sons is named after one of our protected barrier islands named Capers, which is within the Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge and consists of over 66,000 acres. It is a designated class one wilderness. I've never lived off the island and never planned to leave the island. It is our job to protect our environment, our coast and our sea for not only now, but for generations to come. In fact, in our last sentence 
and our city's vision statement it is that, to protect our island for future generations. It's hard to put into words how I feel every time I travel the one and a half miles across the marsh to our island. I immediately take in the ever-changing views of the marsh grass, its vivid greens in the summer, or golden hues in the winter. These views are breathtaking. I can smell the pluff mud and realize the richness of the ecosystems. In fact, coastal wetlands are some of the most productive ecosystems on Earth and generate half of all the commercially harvested seafood in the United States. According to NOAA, our wetlands are too valuable to lose. I say our island because the coast belongs to everyone, not just the lucky few like myself who live there. I've spoken to my state senate before about protecting our coast, and today I plead with you on a national level to please protect our coast. To me, oil spills are like hurricanes. They are devastating, not just for the moment, but for years to come. I have experienced many hurricane scares, but nothing like Hurricane Hugo on September 21, 1989. It took five years to recover. And as with both hurricanes and oil spills, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when they will happen. I've researched the environmental and economic impact of the Deepwater Horizon spill in the spring of 2010, with its 4.9 million barrels of light crude oil leaking over time. It covered the coast from Texas to Florida. The estimated cost to the travel industry was $23 billion. BP donated $25 million to promote tourism afterwards and spent another $100 million to compensate those out of work. This does not take in the loss of 11 lives, the many injuries, and the long-term effects due to toxic exposure. Fisheries can be impacted for decades after an event, and when there is an increased impact of spill in, if there is an um, increased impact spill in the Gulf Stream with its clockwise flow, Think how far-reaching oil would spread, not just the whole East Coast, but potentially going all the way around to Europe. How does one put a value on the loss of wildlife and marine life? We can put a value on the loss of revenue to those who live along the coast, but not to our environment. Charleston's history dates back to 1670, being one of the 13 original colonies. The rich history of Charleston makes it a top tourist destination. Condé Nast named Charleston number one city in America to visit eight years in a row. Southern Living has named it the South's best city three years in a row. Tourism, as Joe said earlier, is a $22.6 billion industry of which two thirds comes from the coast. One out of every 10 jobs in South Carolina is associated with tourism. There is a financial ripple effect from tourism that covers the whole state. Why would we want to risk an already vibrant tourism economy? I've talked environmentally and economically, but let's not leave out the visual aspects. There is a huge onshore industrial aspect to offshore drilling. For the reasons mentioned above, we don't want that industrial look anywhere along our coast. Over 340 municipalities have opposed offshore drilling, which covers the whole East Coast and most of the West Coast. The questionable value to offshore drilling is not worth it. Both our Republican South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster and Attorney General Alan Wilson have opposed offshore drilling. However, this is not a Democrat or a Republican issue. It is a nonpartisan plea to put our environment over the greed of big oil companies who don't give a damn about our coast. I beg of you, our leaders, listen to your constituents, not to big oil. It must be emphasized that tourism and oil are mutually exclusive pursuits. They cannot exist in a functioning economy. The quality of life for future generations would be gone. The oil industry off the East Coast and this historical and environmentally sensitive coastline are not conducive to one another. Thank you for giving me this time be before y'all. Thank you. Thank I have records here if anybody would care for the bibliographies. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Carroll. Next, the chair recognizes Mr. Desai for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the importance of protecting our coastlines from offshore drilling. My name is Vipe Desai and I am a founding member of the Business Alliance for Protecting the Pacific Coast. BAYPAC, 
an alliance of more than 2,400 businesses whose owners and employees love and understand, as I do, just how valuable a healthy Pacific is to our local, state, and national economies. BayPAC aims to ensure the long-term health and vitality of our ocean ecosystems, coastal businesses, communities, and clean energy future. We voiced our opposition to plans for expansion of offshore oil and gas drilling, and I am happy to represent our alliance here today. I would like to begin my testimony with a quick story of how the Pacific has been an important part of my journey. I was an inner city kid growing up an hour away from the ocean in Los Angeles. If you had asked me at that time to describe the ocean, I would have failed to do so as I had never actually seen it. However, a school oceanography field trip to the Port of Los Angeles would first open my eyes to the ocean and all its complexities. Years later, following a shooting at my school, my parents moved our family to Torrance, California, a small community nestled minutes from the beach, which became our real home. It was at that beach that my love of the ocean grew and I discovered my passion for surfing. It is both a sport and lifestyle that has guided my career and family values. It is an understatement that the people of the Pacific Coast, Baypack, and I are disheartened and dismayed that the current administration is planning to open the Pacific to expanded offshore drilling. These plans envision the first federal lease sales off the Pacific Coast in decades. Now that the United States exports oil and clean energy alternatives are becoming cheaper and more widely available, these are terribly short-sighted and reckless plans that are simply not worth the risks. The Pacific Coast is no stranger to the devastation of oil spills. The 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill and the 2015 Refugio oil spill are testaments to this. Decade after decade, American coastal communities are told by the oil and gas industry that it is committed to the safety and the prevention of these disasters, yet time and again they occur. What follows a spill is a drastic economic blow to the tourism industry as transportation, hotels, and restaurants are affected. Non-competitive housing markets due to declining housing prices and the loss of potential buyers emerge. Revenue from commercial fishing and seafood processing decreases. A spill affecting the Port of Los Angeles, an economic powerhouse that accounts for $1.2 billion in cargo a day, would have serious implications for businesses and jobs across the United States. And these are just costs to the people affected. Thousands of species of fish, sea turtles, seabirds, marine mammals, and invertebrates that make the Pacific home would be impacted. In sum, the dangers of offshore drilling put at risk California's 41.9 billion ocean economy and over 600,000 jobs. Likewise, nearly 39,000 jobs and 2 billion in GDP and 128,000 jobs and 10.2 billion in GDP, respectively, would be put at risk in Oregon and Washington. Pacific Coast states have prioritized the development of an environmentally friendly and economically profitable clean energy sector. California currently employs more energy jobs than any other state and has invested $49.2 billion in clean energy. And in both California and Washington, clean energy jobs account for more than 55% of all energy sector jobs. Additionally, clean energy jobs outnumber fossil fuel jobs by over 430,000 and by more than 13 times in California and Washington, respectively. This is the path on which we should continue. To date, more than 340 municipalities across the United States, including 92 along the Pacific Coast, have passed resolutions opposing offshore oil and gas drilling. More than 2,100 elected officials at all levels of government, including the three Pacific Coast governors, have also voiced their opposition. In California alone, polling indicates that 95% of residents agree that the condition of the ocean is important to their quality of life, and 69% are in opposition of new offshore drilling. For myself and on behalf of BayPAC, I applaud and thank members of Congress who are working to protect our oceans and coasts from expanded offshore drilling and for their leadership on bills such as the Coastal and Marine Economies Protection Act, Protecting and Securing Florida's Coastline Act of 2019, and the Atlantic Coastal Economies Protection Act. The health of all American coastal communities are dependent on healthy oceans. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Desai. Uh, next week, the chair recognizes uh, Mr. Yates to testify for five minutes.
Good morning, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Gosar, and members of the subcommittee. My name is David Yates, and I'm the CEO at Clearwater Marine Aquarium, located in beautiful Clearwater Beach, Florida. We are a nonprofit, and as such, we cannot and do not support candidates for office, but we do support issues. We are home with a well-known rescue dolphin, Winter, who lost her tail and for whom we developed a prosthetic tail for her use. Her inspiring story was featured in the major motion pictures Dolphin Tail and Dolphin Tail 2. We are a nonprofit organization involved in marine life rescue, education, research, and conservation, with the majority of our revenue derived from tourist visits to our facility. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the subcommittee today and voice my concerns regarding offshore drilling. On April 20, 2010, the world was stunned to turn on our TVs and watch the devastating aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon explosion. I was one of those, and I'm guessing each of you were also. The explosion started a chain of events that led to the loss of human life, marine life, jobs, and a sense of security by those who make their living in the tourism industry. We can't let this happen again. We're better than this. By the end of the arduous 87-day ordeal, more than 200 million gallons of crude oil were released into the Gulf of Mexico ecosystems and its estuaries. Thousands of marine animals were killed, including threatened and endangered species protected under the Endangered Species Act. During the months following the disaster, coastal businesses across the board were affected, with many suffering severe financial losses and loss of jobs. Tourism declined along the Gulf, and visitors took their business elsewhere. Even in our community, where oil never made it ashore, the perception of oil beaches was enough to drive real estate prices down. Oil drilling is already too close to our coastline, and we cannot allow it an inch closer. The U.S. Travel Association estimated that Florida suffered a $7.6 billion loss in tourism revenue, and other estimates were actually higher. In our case at Clearwater Marine Aquarium, we experienced a clear and distinct downturn to our revenue. Florida is seen as one destination, and if tourists see or perceive an environmental issue anywhere in the state, they will avoid us. Today, I'm here to ask you to protect our tourism, our marine life, and our coastal ecosystems. Any expansion of offshore drilling will threaten the economies that lie at the foundation of our coastal communities, and in Florida, our number one industry, which is tourism. In a 2016 independent economic impact study, Visitor spending in Florida totaled a massive $122 billion. The total impact of out-of-state visitor spending, including indirect and induced effects, supports 1.4 million jobs in Florida. This easily makes out-of-state visitor spending Florida's largest industry, accounting for 9.5% of our GDP and 17.1% of total employment in our state. The southern and western part of Florida's Gulf Coast recently struggled through more than a year of a havoc-wreaking red tide epidemic devastating the tourism industry in these areas, causing businesses to close up and many jobs to disappear. It will take these areas many years to fully recover. We do not need another environmental disaster at this time or in the future. Offshore drilling could be that disaster as it was in 2010. There is not an issue I can think of that unites Floridians more than this issue, exhibited by the overwhelming recent passing of Florida Amendment 9, a ban on offshore drilling in state-controlled waters by an overwhelming nearly 70% vote, as you heard before. The problem is this only applies to state waters, which are th only three to nine nautical miles offshore. An oil spill even hundreds of miles away from shore can and would be catastrophic due to Gulf and Atlantic currents. We constantly hear how we as a country are the, are the most divided that we have ever been. But not surprisingly, opposition to offshore drilling has united us. This trend is seen across the board. The bills under consideration today have a variety of co-sponsors from both parties. Senator Rick Scott has long been a champion of the Florida tourism industry and protection of our beaches. East and West Coast governors of both parties have opposed drilling off their coasts. Just days after Florida Governor Ron DeSantis took office in January in early 2019, he issued an executive order calling for the protection of Florida's water resources. Now we need you, our voice in Congress, to act, as this is not about political party, it is about protecting our coast from an irreversible decision, and it is about making sure that money generated from our coastlines remains with the hardworking Americans whose livelihoods are tied to oil-free beaches. Therefore, I'm here in support of, of the Protecting and Securing Florida's Coastline Act, the Atlantic Coastal Economies Protection Act, and the Coastal and Marine Economies Protection Act. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I want to ask if I could have the same courtesy of introducing uh, our witness here. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, I appreciate uh, Senator Hewitt joining us. Uh, Senator Hewitt grew up in South Louisiana in, uh, in Lake Charles and moved to the North Shore, she's a state senator uh, elected in the 2015, mm -hmm. 2015, uh, representing St. Tammany, Plaquemines, Orleans, and St. Bernard yes. uh, parishes, so four of our parishes in the New Orleans area. Um, Mr. Chairman, one thing I want to note, I'm, I'm looking at the, at the witnesses here, and we have three witnesses um, that, that do not have energy production. 
that do not have energy production, expressing concerns about what may happen. Uh, Senator Hewitt actually doesn't just live in the community where energy, energy production occurs. I'm sorry. On offshore. Offshore, yes, please, thank you. And, and uh, worked in the industry for 20 years, uh, helping to improve the efficiency and safety, and uh, is a leader in our legislature on education issues, and so I really look forward to actually having an expert in this field to testify today. Senator Hewitt, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you, and now, Senator Hewitt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Ranking Chairman, rank, excuse me. Good morning, Chairman Lowenthal, Ranking Member Gosar, and members of the committee. My name is Sharon Hewitt. I'm a state senator from Slidell, Louisiana, representing the coastal parishes of St. Tammany, Orleans, Plaquemine, and St. Bernard. And I'm a former engineering executive for a major oil company responsible for managing major deep water oil and gas assets in the Gulf of Mexico, as Congressman Graves said. Thank you. As the committee considers bills that will affect leasing and seismic activity in the OCS, I urge you to consider the positive economic impact that the oil and gas industry has had on our country and on my home state of Louisiana. Production from the Gulf of Mexico has fueled our nation's energy security and independence. Since the first offshore well was drilled 70 years ago, 90% of the crude oil produced in the United States has been produced from the Gulf of Mexico. Today, the Gulf of Mexico accounts for 17% of the crude produced in the United States. As the number one oil producer and the number two gas producer in the OCS, Louisiana delivers more revenue from offshore production to the federal treasury than any other state in excess of $7 billion a year. In addition to its contribution to the U.S. economy, the oil and gas industry, including pipeline and refining activities, has a $70 billion annual impact on the Louisiana economy and pays $2 billion per year in taxes and fees. Furthermore, not only is Louisiana an, an energy state, but we're also known as the sportsman's paradise because of our relentless efforts to balance offshore oil and gas operations with environmental stewardship. Louisiana is the number one commercial fish landings by weight in the lower 48 states. Our commercial fishermen harvest over 2 billion pounds of fish and shellfish a year, representing nearly 30% of the commercial fish landings of the continental U.S. Wildlife recreation, which includes hunting, fishing, and wildlife watching, has amounted to a $3 billion industry, supporting over 25,000 jobs. A prime example of the symbiotic relationship between the oil and gas industry and the sportsmen fishermen is the Louisiana Artificial Reef Program. In this program, oil and gas platforms with no future utility are decommissioned and converted into artificial reefs to provide new habitats for fish and marine life. Oil and gas companies donate one half of the realized savings over the cost of a traditional platform removal into the trust fund which is used to build and monitor the inshore, nearshore, and offshore artificial reefs. Thirdly, production in the Gulf of Mexico is critical to saving Louisiana's coast and our coastal communities through revenue sharing programs like the 2006 Gulf of Mexico Energy Security Act, GOMESA. In this program, a portion of the federal royalties paid by oil and gas operators on offshore production is shared with the coastal states in recognition of their contributions to the nation's energy security and independence. In Louisiana, funding from Go Mesa is dedicated to coastal restoration and protection projects at the state and local level, and it's expected to be $118 million in fiscal year 2020. The Land and Water Conservation Fund was established by Congress in 1964 to fulfill a bipartisan commitment to safeguard our natural areas water resources and cultural heritage, and to provide recreation opportunities for all Americans. This fund invests earnings from offshore oil and gas leases and has funded over $4.2 billion for more than 43,000 conservation projects throughout the nation since its inception. Looking ahead, while multiple sources of energy will continue to be needed to advance the world's growing energy demands, the demand for oil and gas is projected to still constitute more than 50% of the world's energy needs in 2040, according to the International Energy Agency's new policy scenario. Without an additional investment of roughly $10 trillion, 
the IEA forecasts that there will be an 88 million barrel of oil per day shortfall in 2040 due to the expected decline of the existing well production. Expanding the current federal leasing program will allow the United States to meet this growing demand for not just power and fuel, but for consumer goods such as electronics, medicines, plastics, and clothing that are manufactured from fossil fuels. It is my hope that Louisiana's success in effectively achieving this balance between industry and the coastal communities can be an example of what the United States can achieve in other federal offshore areas. In my opinion, coastal communities do not need to be protected from offshore drilling, but instead should partner with offshore operators to identify synergies for the benefit of all of our citizens. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I look forward to any questions from you or members of the committee. Thank you, Senator he Hewitt. I now um, recognize myself. First, I, I want to thank all the panelists for your testimony. Uh, and now we're going to recognize members of the panel for their questioning. I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes. I also want to uh, correct that statement that I made that, uh, that uh, about offshore drilling. California also is a, has had a significant oil spill and also has significant offshore drilling too. Uh, my first question is to Mr. Desai. Mr. Desai, what prompted the formation of the Bil Business Alliance for Protecting the Pacific Coast? And why are businesses playing such a leading advocacy role nowadays? Yeah, thank you, uh, Congressman Lowenthal. Um, the, the, uh, the formation of the Business Alliance for Protecting the Pacific Coast was inspired by the Atlantic Alliance. We saw what was happening with businesses on the East Coast, and I believe that all these businesses wanted to come together and unify under one voice collectively to oppose offshore oil drilling. We saw the effect that was happening on the East Coast with businesses coming together, having an influence with our elected officials, but also rallying our communities around a cause that was important to all of us. We formed the Business Alliance a little over a year and a half ago and are proud to have 2,400 members be part of this movement. Collectively, we have a coalition of nonprofits that are working with us as well. This is a very unique alliance. It's bipartisan and it is, it is having an effect with our elected officials to oppose offshore oil drilling. Thank you. I'd like to follow up Mr. Desai and that Republican colleagues of mine often point to California and our use of oil and natural gas and the fact that we drive cars and take airplanes is evidence that we're hypocritical for wanting to prevent fossil fuel development, any further fossil fuel development off our state's coast. How do you respond to that argument and how do you reconcile your opposition to offshore oil and gas with a lifestyle that requires the use of a lot of oil. Yeah. Thank you again. Look, uh, I don't mind being called a hypocrite because I know in my heart and in my mind that I am not, as are many other citizens of this country. I can only control things that I can control and there are things that are outside of my control. Within my control, I can make personal adjustments to my lifestyle, driving less, frequenting businesses that are economically friendly or environmentally friendly. And to, to point out my travel here, also, I could have traveled with staff, but I chose to travel by myself rather than having the members of the committee or their staff travel out to California. So we have minimized our footprint on the environment. But I think it's, it's one of those things where we have to work together and we have to understand that there are things that are in our control and things that are outside of our control. Thank you. Also, Mr. Desai, what different industries are represented by the 2,400 members of the Business Alliance for Protecting the Pacific Coast? Are there member companies that are both directly and indirectly reliant on healthy oceans and clean beaches? Yes, absolutely. Our business alliance has members from small mom and pop independent retailers and businesses all the way to large corporations that, are, that have uh, national footprints. But small restaurants, clothing stores, gas stations, uh, automotive dealers, attorneys, 
a wide variety of members make up our alliance. And all of them are concerned regardless of whether they are on the beach or several miles away from the beach or even further. They all appreciate a clean and healthy ocean and recreate on our coasts on a regular basis. Okay, I'm gonna just finish up then with Mr. Desai and my last question would be, California has the sixth largest economy in the world, making the state incredibly important to both the United States, but also to nations abroad. If a major oil disaster were to occur off the California coast, could the economic impacts have national and even international significance? Absolutely, they would, Mr. Uh, Lowenthal. California is one of the most recognizable brands in the world and our coastlines are part of that brand. People from all over the world and all over the country come to California to take in our coastlines and support the businesses along the way. So an oil spill off California would have local, state, national, and international uh, effects. Thank you, and I, and I yield back. Now I'd like to call upon Mr. Westerman for, the, for his five minutes of question. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses for being here. You know, I get confused when I come to this committee because one day we're all Federalist and the next day we're all Nationalist, but today is the day for Federalism. I'm, I appreciate Federalism and uh, how uh, states are standing up for their rights and how they want to uh, protect the beauty in their states. We don't have an, an ocean in Arkansas, so I don't really have a, uh, as much uh, to say about whether we should drill or shouldn't drill in certain areas. Uh, but I do know that in life there are givers and there are takers when it comes to energy. Arkansas is a next net exporter of energy, so we're a, a giver in that sense. And uh, when I look at uh, you know this idea of uh, what's good for one state and what's not good for another state uh, and we th we see a strong push for federalism today uh, if we were to ha be having a hearing on the land and water conservation fund it would be totally opposite we would be talking about how every state should get the uh, have access to this LWCF funding uh, regardless of where it was produced because these are national resources and and we all should uh, get our fair share of them. So if you look at where most of the, the money in the Land and Water Conservation Fund is generated, it comes from my neighbors to the south in Louisiana offshore. A vast majority of the funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund is produced in Louisiana. Uh, then I looked at all the coastal states in our country and they get a whopping 1.2 percent of the Land and Water Conservation Fund back in Louisiana, whereas California gets 33.4 percent of the land and water conservation funding. So, uh, you know, we can talk federalism when we're talking about where we produce oil, but it's nationalism where we talk about the benefits from it. And also, uh, I'd like to submit this uh, chart to, for the record that shows that uh, uh, California's oil production, or, or oil to California refineries, you know, another, another issue that uh, Californians often push for is to limit production in Alaska and we see as Alaska production has gone down the amount of oil imported to California uh, predominantly from Saudi Arabia has greatly increased so another federalism and nationalism um, argument but it's uh, just like to go down the panel do you all think that's fair that Louisiana produces the great vast amount of the land and water conservation fund yet they get uh, a very small percentage of that money back let's just quickly go down the, the table. Mr. Carroll. If you want my opinion, I'm every governor, um, East Coast, West Coast, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Maine, Washington, Oregon, and California all oppose. These are our governors opposing offshore. I understand they oppose, but on the other side, should Louisiana get a bigger share of the Land and Water Conservation Fund since they're producing more, Miss, uh, can we move on down? Go down the dais? Yeah. Does California get more of the Land and Water Conservation Fund? Do you think they're, they should get? I'm sorry, could you state the do question Do you think again? California gets a higher percentage of the Land and Water Conservation Fund than they're entitled to since the revenue is all generated in offshore production in Louisiana? 
Look, I, I don't think it's necessarily a matter of who gets more or less. I think it's a matter that we all contribute something to our economy. California contributes quite but a the, bit. But to the that. land and water conservation fund strictly comes from royalties off of offshore production. Uh, let's move on down the. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure I can comment specifically on, on what's fair or what's not. I do believe we are 50 states and we do get, and we try to get equal share when we can, but on that issue, I'm not sure that it applies. So that's the great nationalism debate there. It's, it's all of our land and water conservation funds, so we'll split it up unfairly, uh, Ms. Hewitt. Well, if the other states don't want their land and conservation fund, we'd be glad to take it. We have lots of great projects in Louisiana. We'd be happy to spend the money. And I would like to yield the remainder of my time to the gentleman from Louisiana. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this, this, this hearing has been fascinating. Um, as, as my friend from Arkansas noted, um, we, I appreciate all of you coming here. I do, and I appreciate you advocating for and, and sharing perspective on the constituents that you represent, whether it be the city, whether it be a group of, of businesses and community members, some of which actually would, would profit from alternative energy productions. Um, but, but this has largely been a, a factless discussion, with the exception of Senator Hewitt. And, and I want to I want to just make one note. I'm going to make one note and discuss about discuss more later. We just had a career official from Department of Interior sit in this committee and say, when we stop producing energy, all it means is that we import more, which is a less safe mechanism. You have a greater chance of spilling. If we, if we care about the environment, we've got to advocate facts. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to talk through some of the facts whenever I get my chance to question witnesses. Yield back. Thank you, Congressman Graves. Uh, I'd recognize my, myself for five minutes, and I, I too would like to thank each and every one of you all for traveling and being here today. Um, I know it's, um, it wasn't easy on, on you all. Um, and uh, I have a question uh, directed towards Mayor Carroll. First, I, I, I failed to recognize Carroll in the back there who uh, played a big part in getting the mayor here. So thank you, thank you too, for coming. Uh, mayor Carroll, you know, we're in a state where um, with uh, the statewide offices held are all by Republicans. Um, Governor Henry McMaster, who was an early and strong supporter of this, this president, um, Attorney General, all statewide elected offices. 77% um, of uh, the, the, uh, the congressional delegation, a Republican. Um, you know, in, in such a divided time where where no one seems to agree on anything up here in Washington, D.C. As it relates to the opposition to offshore drilling in South Carolina, why do you think that this has a, become a bipartisan issue that Democrats and Republicans have come together on? Congressman Cunningham, you're sitting up front because of the coastline. You stood up for our coast, and the people on bipartisan stood behind you and elected you. They do not want the coastline drilled anywhere along the East Coast and no more along any coast. Um, it's already been drilled in the Gulf Coast. Let it stay there. Um, I drove from Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, and looking at the onshore aspect of offshore drilling. That would ruin our tourism industry, which is huge. Thank you, Mayor. And, you know, according to Oceana, uh, fishing, tourism, recreation support, over 86,000 jobs along South Carolina's coast. And they generate over $5 billion in GDP. Uh, you, you know, could South Carolina easily replace these valuable industries with the oil and gas industry? Absolutely not. In fact, it would ruin our tourism industry. Charleston, again, going back to Condé Nast, the number one city in America to visit eight years in a row, Southern Living three years in a row. If we had the oil industry, we would not have the tourism that we have. They are not compatible in South Carolina. And Mayor Carroll, you know, aside from the risk of an offshore spill, what other harmful environmental impacts might result either offshore or onshore uh, from opening the Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf to oil and gas development? The environmental marine life the coastal ecosystems along the Marstons that I was describing before, that is the cradle of, of beginning of all sea life. Growing in the larva of the shrimp, the fish, everything grows in the Martian and comes offshore. 
That's the beginning of the sea life. If we had an oil spill, the seafood industry would be gone. And it took years for it to be recovered in the Louisiana area and the Gulf states, all the way around to Florida. Ask those fishermen. And, and can you state how, uh, how much of a, a threat it would be, even if it didn't happen off of South Carolina's coast, say it happened to our neighbor uh, to the south of Georgia or Florida or maybe going north? Going back to the Gulf Stream, the Gulf Stream is a clockwise um, current of water. It would spread all the way up the coast, one that we could not control. Not only would it um, hit South Carolina, North Carolina, the Outer Banks, um, Upper um, New Hampshire, New York, New Jersey, um, Massachusetts, and then on around to Europe. We, it's, it would be a terrible place to do it. Mayor Carroll, last, uh, last week we had a uh, roundtable discussion with stakeholders in our community discussing um, our bill um, um, that we introduced here. And could you uh, give, uh, give a summary of, of, of those discussions um, and what the concerns are of, of people back in the low country? I'd be proud to. Um, we have a thing called the South Carolina Beach Advocates. It's made up of every coastal city along the coast of South Carolina. You came and held a round table. Um, a lot of mayors were there. Everybody is there to protect our coast. We do not want to see our coast industrialized. It is a tourism related coast and a seed food industry related coast. People come for that, those aspects. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you to all members of the panel. And, um, you know, earlier um, our members um, addressed the Land and Water Conservation Fund and whether or not it should be equally allocated. And I think that what's missing in a uh, political system is some consistency. I wonder if that would be the same uh, fact as it relates to the taxes generated state by state if they wish to be allocated or if they wish uh, for them to be distributed um, as they are raised. But that's, that's not a question, but more of an observation. So um, uh, I'm going I'm to cede my time back and um, Me. recognize uh, uh, Ranking Member Mr. Gosar. Oh, sorry, Bishop. It's okay. I'll take Gosar. That's a cute <laughs> name, too. Look, I want to thank all of you for being here. You all had to travel great distances. I guess I can be a little bit more superior than all of you. I actually walked to work, but that's, that's <laughs> different. It was my footprint. Look, we have talked a great deal about things and used them much in isolation, as if you can compartmentalize and there is no kind of introduction. My, my good friend from California, Mr. Uh, Lowenthal, I'm sorry that he left, um, his home state in 2018 actually was a net increase in demand for energy and oil, but also in the importation of energy and oil, to the fact that California right now imports 60% of all the energy and oil that they use, most of which comes from Saudi Arabia. So we may, as a country, be a net, net exporter, but it is not all the same, and it has different implications. That is also why if Florida passes a referendum on state waters, that's perfectly right to do. I applaud you for doing that. But we are now talking about federal waters. And at least we're talking about legislation that does go through the logical concept. The problem I have, and I'm not calling any of you hypocrites, I'm calling the process hypocritical. Every governor that you have mentioned on, on states wants to have input on what takes place in federal waters. Yet at the same time, my governor and my state wants to have input on what takes place on federal land within my state. And we are continually denied by Congress, by this committee, as well as by law, the ability of doing that. Our access to land is denied, and that's why it is hypocritical when you're demanding access to federal waters at the same time. There is not a parity here, and it is something that, I, that is galling to me, which is why this entire discussion is difficult. Also, one of the things I want to throw out for the committee's consideration when we do the markup of the Rooney Bill, the military line is an arbitrary line that was put in there for military reasons, not for tourism reasons. And that western edge of that line, I think, is actually closer to New Orleans than it is to the Florida coast. And yet sometimes I think we need to, if we're going to play around with that permanent line and make it permanent, we have to realize that there may be some areas of negotiation or some areas in which you can make logical decisions as long as you maintain the military purpose for that line and that exclusion in the first place. Senator Hewitt, let me ask you a few questions. You come from a state that is doing what we've now been told is humanly impossible. 
you have tourism, you have the fishing industry, and you have, and you have uh, energy production. How in the hell do you say to Louisiana, balance those three things and do it effectively? Well, we do it very carefully. You know, it's not that difficult, and we have 70 years of experience doing it. And so, you know, I would say to, you know, those states that are represented that are fearful of the unknown, look to Louisiana. We have done it, and, you know, we excel in all of those areas. Um, you know, there's plenty of state regulations, federal regulations. You could coexist, and we found, again, a lot of synergies between those different industries that uh, I think allow us to, to excel. The oil industry does have well-paid jobs, but are there other benefits that the state receives from oil and gas production on federal waters? Well, it's a tremendous economic boost. There's certainly a lot of indirect jobs, as you pointed out, you know, that are related to the oil and gas industry. It's, a, it's an entire um, business. You know, it's interesting, I had actually a dentist in central Louisiana tell me the other day when oil prices dropped, his business dropped. He's in central Louisiana. You wouldn't normally think of a dentist as really being one of those indirect jobs, but it is the lifeblood of our state. Uh, it has been the primary industry in our state, and I believe it will be for many, many years to come. Would there need to be statutory changes made for other states to benefit from energy production off their coast the way the Gulf states do? Well, GoMesa has been a, a wonderful thing for us. You know, we get, um, you all I'm sure understand how GoMesa works, but 37.5% of the royalty that is paid on offshore oil production actually comes back to the coastal states and Louisiana gets the predominant share of that. So statutorily, those states that participated in offshore drilling, I would assume would want to um, broaden the GoMesa Act to be able to benefit uh, as well from that. Although it's interesting, I should point out, as you know, the onshore states are getting 50% back. We're only getting 37.5% back in offshore waters, which, which we believe is a little bit unfair. Thank you, and I'm sure if you weren't to tell me that, Mr. Graves would be sure that he would tell me that too. I still want to have access to my land. I'll yield back. Recognize Mr. Hearn for five minutes of questions. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, it's great to see our witnesses here today for, you know, to testify on our coastal communities and offshore drilling. And as members of this com subcommittee, it should be our priority to responsibly expand our American energy supply, create new American jobs, and to generate revenue for our treasuries. These have been the tenets of the Trump administration's approach to our energy sector, and these priorities have helped to ensure that we retain our energy independence, and some would say dominance and that we do not become dependent on other countries like Russia and Saudi Arabia for our energy needs. However, these, the bills we're discussing in this hearing seek to reverse these trends and to push us toward energy dependence, as we've been describing so far. Uh, I have a series of questions, but I think uh, I would like to yield my time to my friend and colleague from Louisiana, Mr. Garrett. Thank you, uh, Congressman Hearn. I appreciate, I appreciate you yielding. I want, to, I want to follow back up on what we talked about earlier. I want to say it again. I, I really appreciate all of you being here. These are policy decisions that we're making that shouldn't be made based on emotion or feelings or thoughts. We've got to operate on facts. And so I'm going to say it again. The National Research Council that did an analysis looking at pipelines, looking at, at maritime transportation, looking at, at, at barge and rail and, 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 and all sorts of different handling of energy including exploration and production activities. They found, I'm going to say it again, it was less safe, less safe to import oil, to, to put it on ships and barges and other things than it is to produce it, to do exploration and production activities. And, and, and so, you know, Mr. Mayor, I, I commend you for coming here and representing your constituents and their views. This is the Congress where we have to make decisions based on facts. And based on the policy that you were advocating, you were talking about making our environment less safe. You made a suggestion that we cannot have energy production in fisheries. You made a statement that, that an oil spill would devastate or destroy fisheries in South Carolina. Let me give you some numbers. Again, I hate to introduce facts into this discussion, but in 2017, the most recent year that, that fisheries data is available, and this is from National Marine Fisheries Service, I know there are different 
uh, uh, numbers out there to quantify, including the ones that Senator Hewitt introduced. In South Carolina, there were 15.7 million pounds of fishery landings. In Louisiana, there were nearly 900 million pounds in this area that is supposedly destroyed by energy production. Um, in 2010, when Deepwater Horizon occurred, we had 10 times, 10 times more fisheries landings than South Carolina, and, and even uh, California uh, multiple times, uh, the, the, the fisheries in Louisiana as compared to California. This is why we have 80 to 90 percent of all of the offshore production in the United States. When, when uh, Senator Hewitt, we hadn't scripted this, when you go fishing in the offshore, what do you tie up to? A drilling platform. That's where the structure is. That's where the fisheries are. Now look, do we need to continue to strive to have the safest production in the world? Absolutely, we do. We need to continue to strive. Uh, Senator Hewitt, do, do you have any idea um, uh, on the amount of energy that we produced versus that has been spilled in, in the Gulf? Have you seen any statistics? I have not. I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be like a drop in the bucket, though. I can tell you that. I can't it, it, quote the number. It, it is. And even the comment earlier, the, the, the statistic that was used by, by my friend from South Carolina talked about 8 million uh, gallons spilling. That was onshore. That was onshore that spilled from Katrina. As we all know, in the offshore, uh, they, they had a few spills, but they were very small compared to the onshore. You know, it's less safe having a ship there that is sitting there in the Gulf. And Katrina was one of the most powerful storms in American history. Um, it, those spills were from tanks and other structures that were onshore, not, not in the offshore space. Um, uh, it, it's been fascinating listening to, to Mr. Bishop discuss earlier. We're talking about people coming in and regulating lands or waters that they don't own and don't have control over. That's confusing to me. We need to be careful about going to a neighbor and saying what you can do with your property and, and what you can't do with your property if you don't own it. Now look, you need to have some input and say so about what happens, but all these people sitting here talking about the environment, these are the same people that have opposed our efforts in Louisiana to, to adjust revenue sharing to make sure that we can restore our own coast. And, and Senator Hewitt's talking about revenue sharing of 37.5%. That's only from new production. So in reality, last year we got 0.4%, or in 2017, 0.4% revenue sharing compared to 50% in the, in the onshore. I recognize Mr. Graves for another five minutes. All right. Um, <laughs> can't wait. I. Um, uh, I, I, I want to go back and address um, some other comments. It was said, when you drill, you spill. I'll say it again. That's not what statistics show. It shows that you spill through transporting it from other places. We had a, I think he was hired in the Clinton administration, a career official sitting here who just said, when we stop producing domestically, we import more energy. It, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, uh, Senator Hewitt, could you talk a little bit about the ports in the state of Louisiana, I, I heard it said earlier that the port of South Carolina would be destroyed or what have you if, if energy production occurs in, in South Carolina. Could you, could you discuss uh, some of the ports in Louisiana? Well, of course, we have a tremendous port system in Louisiana. We're at the mouth of the Mississippi. We have one of the top ports in the Port of New Orleans. As you know, Port Fouchon is the energy port in South Louisiana. It's actually located on the Gulf of Mexico. There's more than 250 companies that are utilizing Port Fouchon, and it also happens to be there at Grand Isle, one of the prime fishing locations in the Gulf. And so I believe that you can do it all, Congressman, as I know you do as well. Uh, Senator, do you know what state has five of the top 15 ports in the United States? I'm pretty sure it's the state of Louisiana. Uh, Senator, do you know which state uh, handles about 17 percent of all the nation's maritime commerce through our waterways? I believe it's our home state of Louisiana. Um, uh, Senator, do you know which state was, uh, w was indicated by U.S. Fish to have the most productive estuary on the North American continent? It's the Bayou State, yes, sir. And, and, and Senator, do you know which state is, uh, was found to have the largest wintering habitat for migratory waterfowl? I'm going to guess it's our state of Louisiana. How about that? How about that? We actually can have production. Uh, we can supply this nation's energy needs 
and we can have one of the most productive estuaries, we can have some of the top fishing in the United States, we can have the top ports in the United States. Look, I, I'm, I'm gonna keep saying this. I, I appreciate you being here and sharing your opinions. Th this, isn't, this isn't grammar school, this is Congress. We've gotta make policy decisions based upon facts. I was the lead trustee for the state of Louisiana in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And, and, and you go look at my comments on those responsible parties. You go look at how we held them accountable, how it was the Obama administration that was preventing us from forcing them to clean up. And I'm not, I'm not kidding, the Obama administration stopping us from forcing them to clean up the oil. When you look at the trillions and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas we've produced, the billions and billions of barrels of oil, we do it safer. You can look at statistics, we do it safer than other places. If we're not doing it there, we're gonna be importing it from other countries that have less safe standards. Places like Venezuela, places like the Middle East, places like African nations, less safe. Do you care about the global environment or do you not? Now look, we advocate an all of the above energy strategy. We, we think that we need to have renewables, we need to have nuclear, hydro, all of the, in, including oil and gas, we need to continue to strive to make sure that it's safer and cleaner. Um, but, but, but sitting here and operating on a motion, it's, it's very, very dangerous in, in terms of what some of the outcomes could be. Senator, can you talk in your 20 years in the energy industry and just share some of your opinions or what you've seen in terms of the culture of safety in, those, in, in, in that business? Well, no one wants to be safer than an offshore oil and gas worker because you want everyone to go home. And I will tell you that the safety culture is such that anyone at any time can stop any operation because of a safety concern. And it is, uh, it is taught on a daily basis, it is lived, and it is something that, um, that I've personally been responsible for in offshore operations. And, uh, I will tell you the safety, they continue to improve their safety records offshore in terms of recordable incidents and uh, preventable accidents. And I believe you could hold up that industry to many, many other industries in terms of their safety record, and it would be extremely competitive. Um, Senator, thank you. Look, I, I want to work with all of you. I, I do. I want to make sure that we look at facts and that we work to address concerns you have. Mayor, if, if, uh, if your town is a town that, that doesn't want energy production, then let's work and let's figure out are there buffers that could be put in. Let's take a look and see where there's actual reserves, where there is energy, and determine if it even makes sense to go off of South Carolina. But many of these communities have actually opposed even trying to get the data to understand where, where their reserves exist, even though we had more permits issued issued under the Obama administration than we've had under Trump. I just think it's important that we all let the emotion uh, die down a bit, that we operate on facts and we make policy decisions that are actually going to yield the best interest of this country. Yield Mr. Congressman, if I may. Um, may I? I? Well, let me recognize Mr. Gosar first. It's his turn and then we'll get back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, can, I'd like to get our slide up. So now over the next 25 years, the global population is to grow from 7.5 billion to roughly 9 billion people. And even today, there are a billion people who do not have access to electricity. The world needs affordable, reliable energy to enable human progress for everyone. In the US, we expect to have power when we need it, which is why baseload sources of energy like oil and natural gas are so important. We need them when renewables fall short due to weather conditions like extreme cold, snowstorms, no wind, no sunshine, and times of night. We need them when the renewables fall short due to the weather conditions like extreme cold or storms. And if you look on the slides, particularly on the screen, you'll see that oil and gas demand is expected to grow by more than 25% and will still con constitute more than 50% of the world's energy needs by 2040. Senator Hewitt, you have seen, certainly seen a growth in all the renewables in recent years, and I support all the above. But when you start to look at this, the renewables are a small segment. There's no way possible that we can actually go to a full renewable application because of the dependency. Um, what do these charts tell you uh, about the trajectory of the global energy consumption and whether or not renewables will be able to meet those rising demands? Well, I think, you know, the data is, is pretty clear in the forecast here. You know, when you look ahead to 2040, 
Certainly there is going to be a growing energy demand worldwide and renewables are increasing as are, you know, oil and gas. You can't get there with just renewables. You cannot get there with just renewables. Uh, as you pointed out, the population is increasing. You cannot do it with just renewables. You're going to always have in the foreseeable future a need for oil and gas. Now here's the other part of it. If you look at that top chart, the, the darker blue in the bottom left corner of that top chart is the existing supply of oil and gas. So as those wells production declines, the only way to continue to keep that wedge of oil and gas delivered is to drill new wells. And so that's what the light blue represents up there. It's a $10 trillion investment between now and 2040 to continue to meet the oil and gas demand that's going to be required because, again, the renewables and coal and other sources cannot deliver what the world is going to need. So, um, Senator Hewitt, uh, with a state like Louisiana, um, if we forgo the baseload power like oil and gas, um, how will we reach our demand? I mean, the other side is not interested in looking at the, and the minerals like rare earths, exploring rare earths. They want to be dependent upon places like China that dictates almost 100% of the rare earths for the new technology of batteries. Batteries, if any expert is ever consulted about that, will tell you that those batteries don't work. It's going to be the weakest part of the so solution. We've looked at molten uh, salts. We've looked at all sorts of different applications. They don't want to do hydropower, you know, so once again, the battery storage of water seems to be kind of a problem. So how do we make this work? Well, I think we do continue to have to have an all of the above energy strategy, and I agree with that. You know, in my home district, we have a, a company that's building some of the largest windmill turbine blades in the country. You know, we have solar panels. We're, we're, it, we're exploring all different types of energy, but there's always going to be a need for fossil fuels, and we need to be able to open up other parts of the ocean so that we can explore for those because we are blessed, our country is blessed with natural resources, and I can't imagine a country such as Venezuela, living in a country like Venezuela, where you have rolling blackouts. Energy is such a fundamental need, and to not explore it and provide for our citizens is just sort of difficult for me to understand. Well, and, and, and I see from the perspective of the last kind of cold spells up in the Northeast, we were reliant on that horrible country called Russia. We actually had to park a tanker off there, uh, uh, taking uh, uh, exports from them, and they produce it much dirtier, and we do it much more environmentally clean. In fact, my colleague from California is much more reliant on uh, foreign oil sources than they are domestic sources. So we do it right, and if I'm not mistaken, in 15, 16, and 17, we led the world in carbon emission reductions across the world. Isn't that pretty astounding, Senator? Well, it is, and if I'm not mistaken also, I think that uh, the United States' contribution to carbon emissions is minuscule, again, compared to the entire CO2 um, emissions across the world. Thank you, Senator. Well, you've completed your testimony. You're not done. Uh, <laughs> I would like to recognize Mr. Soto for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start by mentioning that we are united in the Florida delegation uh, in support of the bill presented by uh, Representative Rooney. Uh, we right now have a 125 mile oil drilling moratorium, uh, and we want to make it permanent. Uh, currently, it would expire by 2022. And there's three major reasons for that. First, our beaches, our ocean, our gulf, uh, the beauty and pristineness of all these things, that's why we live in Florida. And secondly, our biggest industries, as has been mentioned by Mr. Yates, are tourism and agriculture, by far. Uh, we also have military readiness reasons why uh, these moratoriums have been put in place. Uh, Eglin Air Force Base, Tyndall Air Force Base uh, also are reasons why uh, this moratorium was put in place. And as uh, Mr. Yates had mentioned, Florida voters have already expressed the will uh, to have a moratorium on the state uh, 
sovereignty waters uh, just recently. So this is about protecting our way of life. It's about our economy and it's about our military readiness. And we know the economic impact, and thank you, Mr. Yates, for talking quite a bit about the BP oil spill, 26,000 jobs, $2.4 billion in sales, uh, over 200 million gallons dumped into the Gulf. But I want you to walk us through from the day it happened with that oil spill, just your personal observations from Clearwater Marina or Marina Aquarium, what it meant for you all and uh, what it meant for your neighbors uh, in Clearwater, Florida after that happened. Sure, thank you, Congressman. So it's, uh, I wear basically three hats. I have the environmental hat, I have the marine life rescue hat, and the tourism hat. Most of our revenue at Clearwater, I mean, aquarium comes from tourism-based visits by visitors out, out of state. 70% 70, 70 of our visitors come from out of state. So we rely on that. So as we watched this come down, we kind of wore all three hats. Uh, number one, we had to prepare for the marine life rescue aspect of this. Even though oil did not hit our beaches, uh, we were a secondary marine life rescue uh, area center for sea turtles. We had a number of sea turtles sent to us from northern rescue centers that were overrun. Overrun could not have any more room for sea turtles at that time. So we, we were overflow at that point. So even though the spill physically was not near us, we cared for a number of animals that were shipped to us because those in the northern areas could not care for them at the time. So we had the marine life rescue aspect of that. We saw the, 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 the devastating impact that oil spill caused on animals firsthand. We didn't have to guess, we saw it. On the tourism side, um, as you mentioned, Florida is, uh, is a very unique state in the sense that people see us as one, one area. If there's one drop of oil on a Florida beach anywhere, everybody assumes the entire area of Florida has, has oil on all the beaches. That's not the case. Uh, we see that all the time. If there's a hurricane, we find out that there's, uh, the, the, and, and it can go across one part of the state, tourists are, and consumers around the country look at that and go, it must be covering all of Florida when it's not. So we saw immediately a downturn. We were coming out of the 08 recession at that time, and we expected tourism in our area and Florida-wise to grow at a much higher rate than it did at that time. We saw a very depressed uh, growth of rate of tourism after the recession than we expected. Um, in our case, our numbers, for example, the prior four quarters for Clearwater Marine Aquarium revenue-wise, uh, and actually attendance-wise, growth year to year, year to year to the prior year, prior four quarters, 33% growth, 19, 26, and 32. The quarter the spill hit, we were, we were negative 10%. So we immediately saw that the economic impact ourselves. It wasn't a talking point for the entire state. We saw it ourselves. So it was very direct, very clear. And the concern we have is perception. The problem is perception. Even if we don't have oil in our beaches, the perception rules in the marketplace, that's just the way it works. There was a survey done, I, I saw, I think 15 months after the spill happened. And 18% of North Americans surveyed, respondents surveyed, believed there was still oil on Clearwater Beach. We never had it in the first place. That's the issue. Well, thanks for talking about, you know, it's not only just the facts of what tar balls or oil wash up on the beaches, it's merely the perception. Right. People can go on vacation anywhere in the world, and uh, whether they're choosing South Carolina or Florida, any slight deviation that may make them think that uh, they're not gonna have that wonderful experience that we Floridians experience every day uh, will have an effect in the billions. Uh, I know having a little place out by St. Pete Beach in Treasure Island, it's deeply personal to us and so many Floridians from Florida's 9th uh, Congressional District. So, you know, we're here united as both Democrats and Republicans uh, to avoid this oil drilling from ever happening off Florida's coast. So thanks for being here. Thank you again all the panelists and all the members. Uh, I think we've had a, a full hearing. Um, I, but I want to ask the panelists, in a very brief time, in maybe one minute or less, is there any concluding thought or is there any question that you wished you had been asked that you want to respond to, or just anything that came up that you'd like to respond to? So I'm going to start with the mayor. Mayor Carroll, is there thank, anything you'd thank like you to? Thank you very much. Besides the governors, let's look at the municipalities, over 340 in both coasts. Just look at the alliances of 46,000 businesses and 500,000 fishing families. Just look at the Department of Defense, the Air Force, NASA, Florida Defense Support Task Force, all opposed. New England, South Atlantic, Mid-Atlantic, Pacific Fishery Management Councils opposed. Commercial recreational fishing interests such as the Southeastern Fisheries Association, Snook and Game Fish Foundation, 
Fisheries Survival Fund, Southern Shrimp Alliance, North Atlantic Marine Alliance, Bill Fish Foundation, and the International Game Fish all oppose. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Desai, one concluding thought or any question you, you, you wish you had been asked? Thank you, Congressman Lowenthal. Yes, I would like to address uh, one last uh, conclusion. Um, to, to Mr. Uh, Graves here, I would like to say that we need to follow the facts. Okay, I didn't come up here to just drop numbers and share emotions. I came up here to make a case that our coastal waters are important to not only our nation, but all to, also to our states. The United States already exports oil and clean energy alternatives. They're becoming cheaper and more widely available. And as to Congressman Cunningham when, when in his statement, when you drill, you spill, I would like to add when you drill, you kill. You kill our habitats, you kill small businesses. You, uh, these are facts. The facts. The facts are in. Let's, uh, sir, the facts are let's, in Let's not get into a diatribe and, and argue. Okay. Okay. So, I'm not. I'm not here to make things up. Okay. I, know we, I know we're talking about federal waters, but what happens in federal waters also affects our states and our local coastlines. Thank you, Mr. Desai. Mr. Yates. Yes, we're talking about facts. So here's a few facts. There are two different surveys show between five and $22 billion of economic loss from, um, on tourism on Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf states. In the state of Florida, it's our number one tourism market again. $122 billion were spent by 126 million tourists last year. It's almost 10% of our GDP and 17.1% of our total employment. So beyond the conservation environmental aspect and the tragedy on marine life and animals, uh, this is an e enormous part of our state and we simply cannot put that at risk. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, the concluding word, Senator Hewitt. Thank you, Chairman. Well, for those states that are importing oil and gas, I'd like to offer uh, the services of the state of Louisiana. We are about to become the single largest exporter of liquefied natural gas, and it is clean energy, and we'd be happy to make that available to those instead of uh, importing. I wanted to touch on seismic briefly because I know that's part of the legislation briefly. you all are considering and we did not talk about that any. As you know, seismic is basically, seismic surveys are a blast of air uh, that sends a sound wave that through the earth that allows us to model uh, this, the, the land below and if there's any oil or gas or, or uh, water in the land. The concern sometimes is raised about the impact of that on marine mammals. We've been doing this for 50 years. I'm going to say that there have been, uh, there's no scientific evidence that shows the risk of direct physical injury to marine mammals is extremely low, and that there's also no scientific evidence that demonstrates biologically significant negative impacts on marine life. And so I would submit to you that we need seismic data to better understand uh, the opportunities that are available to us. It's just like having a, a world-class hospital and not allowing people to do uh, MRIs or ultrasounds. We need the ability to be able to better understand and model the opportunities that are available. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking Member Gosar. Yeah, now, now uh, Chairman, um, you know I'm, I'm from Arizona. We don't have a coastline. But I, I might Maybe with sea level rise. Well, you know, we always, we always, you know, we always pray, you know, for oceanfront property in Arizona. You know, coming your property. way soon. <laughs> my, my question to you is: During a hurricane, don't we have oil spills because boats are capsized? I mean, it happens on the on beaches, if I'm not mistaken. It may not be to what we talk about, but it's a drop of oil. So I think we ought to be careful about that. And last but not least economics of, you know, Arizona is a big tourism state, and you don't get tourism if you don't have a functional economy somewhere else, that people want to come to see, but if they don't have disposable incomes, they, they can't come. So just, just some, some notes of. Well, I, th th they're your thoughts. I think people here are also saying the other side is, let's not destroy the Grand Canyon also. That's why people come to Arizona. So with that, I'd like to thank the, wit the testimony of the witness and the members. Obviously, you can tell that you know, this is a very important issue that we're raising. People feel very passionately about that. It's important that we have 
this venue to discuss our differences and also to see if we can find commonalities. Uh, and I think out of this, witnesses on the com or members of the committee may have some additional questions that they may want to ask the witnesses. Uh, they're going to have to submit those in writing within three business days. That's Rule 3.0. And uh, members of the panel, following the hearing and the hearing record, we're going to keep the record open for 10 days for your responses back if you get any questions. If there's no further business, Without objection, this committee stands adjourned. We'll take the grand Nice to meet you. Same Have here. you ever met Harry? That's what they're saying. Pardon? Have you ever met Harry by chance, Harry Connick? Have you ever met him? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, he's uh, he, an amazing guy. Appreciate it.